Well, guys, we're going to have a couple of others probably straggle in late. But uh, I do want to go ahead and get started. We told everybody we'd start at 6. So um, I've handed out two sheets of blank piece of, or two sheets of kind of the white paper there. One of them is an outline of what we're going to be discussing. And then the second one, obviously, if you want to use that to scribble some notes, you're welcome to it. Um, first, I want to introduce myself and the team. Not everybody knows everyone here. So um, Luke is handling the audio visual for us today. He's our superstar in the back. Andrea, my lovely wife, is kind of handling uh, all the computer stuff for us. And then we've got Misty and Michelle are helping folks in uh, that are coming in a little bit late, but I'll introduce them a little bit later. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am or much about me, uh, I started in the mortgage business back in 2003 and uh, started working with a company that uh, focused on refinances back when rates were at a 30 year low. And uh, I quickly realized that wasn't going to be something that was going to sustain kind of a long-term business model. So um, I started working with investors and uh, thinking investors can buy five, six, seven properties a year, whereas your average home buyer is going to buy maybe once every five to seven years. So um, as I made that shift, I found a lot of investors that were encouraging me to get my real estate license because they liked what I did for them on the mortgage side. And um, so after getting my license in 2005, I was doing a little bit of both. Had my kind of one foot on either side of the fence there. And at some point, um, the mortgage industry changed enough. I ran into Jennifer Hernandez's team, who is the hostess for, for or provided the office space here. And then Tim is part of her team. If you guys want to uh, uh, introduce yourselves at the end of the evening, Tim is here on behalf of Jennifer while she's out with some family stuff this evening. Um, but they have taken exceptional care of all of our clients. and. Uh, Andrea, if you wouldn't mind, pull up the website real quick and then click on the show them where the lending tab is. Just in case you guys have any questions, um, you can go to our website, super easy, tarl.com. Bottom right hand corner, there's a little dollar sign on a blue uh, tab there. Just click on that and you'll find right here, you, you can find all of our uh, legacy mutual contact information so that you guys can uh, has, ask any mortgage questions you might have. Um, but I actually had a, a co-op transaction with Jennifer's team a couple of years ago, realized that I, while I was good on the mortgage side, she was great. And I decided to let her handle all that and I started focusing exclusively on real estate. After having worked with these investors for a number of years, um, I saw a lot of different ways you can make money in real estate. And that's part of where I began to learn. I also bought my first rental property at 21 years old. While all my other friends were renting apartments in college, I bought a little place and had that thing for about 15 years before I finally sold it which as a landlord, uh, that is some hard work, uh, especially if it's not right around the corner. Um, so started in the mortgage business, real estate in 2005. I got my broker's license in 07, and I started Tarl Anderson Properties and another little side business that uh, called LocateMyApartment.com. Same people, we provide very similar service just for apartment leasing. Um, but that's kind of how I ended up where I am. Um, now I wanted to ask you guys, if you don't mind, and by the way, I'm not a professional speaker. Let me put that out there now. Um, I, I need you guys to interact with me. I hope you will um, ask questions. We've got a smaller group than uh, I thought might be here. We had about uh, twice as many people say they might show up. So uh, this will free up a lot of time so that we can have more one-on-one -on -one if you guys want to interact and ask questions. So, um, But I want to ask you first, um, why are you here tonight? If you don't mind, just Chime in if you don't, and you don't want to, I'll just guess what you're here for. Um, any, any thoughts? Well, I, yes? I told you, um, this is my husband, Kurt, I don't know if y'all met. Nice to meet you, Kurt. Um, and so he's been interested in wanting to buy houses, remodel, sell them, that kind of stuff. And okay. He's in the um, building materials business right now. So. Okay. So I have a lot of people who come to me and say, well, I watch a lot of HGTV. HGTV. <laughs> and um, for those in the real estate, mortgage industry, title business, it's something that I think we hear a fair amount. And everyone has kind of this romantic idea of what it's supposed to be like, and it seems really fun, and the idea of decorating a house exactly the way you want to, it sounds really great, but in all reality, there's a quite a bit of work that goes into it. So um, it's kind of changed how our business works, because there's a lot of people who I kind of refer to as weekend warriors, who buy a property, they want to do some paint and carpet, fix it up, and then turn it into a rental, or they want to try to sell it. The problem is, is that the cost going in 
and the time and trouble that it takes, and then the cost going out, you gotta pay those darn real estate agent fees um, when it's time to sell. So there are certainly some obstacles um, to that process. And so um, kind of going back to, I was hoping you guys might tell me why you're here, but let me guess, I've got three reasons that I would anticipate that most of you are here. One, either you're kind of curious about real estate as an investment, um, you've seen it on TV, um, maybe you're working really hard, and your day job is great, you're comfortable. Sounds good. Um, maybe um, your day job, you're comfortable, but uh, we have an idea as to where we want to be in the future, and we just aren't getting there. Um, you need some investment opportunities that may help kind of launch in that direction. Um, so the curious group. Um, oftentimes, um, you've got a little bit more money at the end of your paycheck, and so you start investing it. Is that going to go into CDs? U.S. Treasuries, do you put it in stock market, 401k? And a lot of people just don't know what to do with their money. They don't know where to put it. Um, one of the things I can tell you is that I've worked in the mortgage industry, been in real estate, but what a lot of people don't know about me is I actually, when I stopped doing loans, I'm an 80-hour a week kind of guy. And when I was doing mortgage in real estate, that filled that whole 80 hours. But when I stopped doing mortgages, I actually went to work for a financial services company. And I worked 40, 50 hours a week, kind of regular daytime hours. And I trained financial advisors on how to coach their clients. And one of the things that I found and I realized, which is kind of scary, but a lot of financial advisors don't really know what they're doing. Um, the ones who you're looking to for advice on your money, um, the guys that are really personable, they're great salesmen that make a lot of money, they're out selling. They don't have time to be looking at which stocks to invest your money. They're simply following the orders of someone above them. So, um, and a lot of people say, well, I've got all my money in my 401k, I'm buying my company stock, but for those of us, I was in college when Enron kind of went belly up, and I remember a girl sitting in the back of one of my classrooms, and she was telling the story of her dad who had worked all these years, and his whole retirement was in Enron stock, and he just had to start all over at 60 plus years old. And I remember that feeling and thinking, Man, I don't know if I'm ready to turn loose of my money to someone else who I don't know. There's just there, there's a certain lack of transparency uh, in a lot of the investment world. And so I think that's part of the appeal for real estate is a lot of people say, you know what? I can see it, touch it, I can be there, and I have a little bit more control. Even if I don't have as much experience as a professional hedge fund manager or whatever the case may be, at least it's mine. Um, and so when considering risk versus reward, um, you've got um, a couple of different options you can pick from. Um, something that you can see and touch, somebody that you just write your, write your name, sign a check, or whatever the case may be, and you've got to kind of pick which one of those makes more sense. Our second group of our three is the group that they're interested, but they have questions. These are the people that have watched HGTV. They've got a little money set aside, and they know that CDs and their checking accounts not going to grow fast enough to get them where they want. And so the HGTV people um, I refer to as my interested. They're a little beyond curious, they're interested. And so I want to show a quick little clip of a maybe 30 to 60 second um, promo for one of the many, many TV shows that are on HGTV. And I hope you guys will uh, enjoy. Um, there's a lot of scary scenes in here if you've never done any house flipping. I'm Tarek and this is my wife, Christina. We're real estate agents. Ever since the market crashed, it's been a rocky road. With a family to support, we're starting a new business, flipping foreclosures, short sales, and bank-owned properties. We pay for these houses in cash. Sold to this gentleman right here. Some of the houses are easy fixes. Just cosmetic, paint, flooring. But others are total teardowns. Hey, there's a deck whoa, 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 whoa. here. This thing is rotted. And you never know what you've got until you walk through that door. Oh my god. We have, a, we have a major problem here. Oh my god, it smells so bad. What is that? Every window's broken. We are so screwed. I mean, this is the worst ever. <laughs> I want to watch you catch no, a chicken. No, I'm manning the ball. I want to watch you catch a chicken. <laughs> oh, shit. We got a leaker. Oh my god. There's something living in there. Tadpoles. <laughs> this is so bad. The bigger the disaster, the better the makeover. We turn distressed properties into beautiful family homes. And we love what we do. So that's kind of just a little sample 
of what so many people see on HGTV and other television programs. And it sounds like a lot of fun, but what they don't realize is this is a couple of real estate professionals, and it's not just one, it's two. And they're ta tackling this thing together. Uh, it's a lot of time and it's a lot of work. Uh, a lot of the clients that I talk to, um, the idea of spending your nights and weekends swinging hammers and rolling paint, it just loses its uh, appeal really darn quickly. So um, the, the lack of time, the, the requirement for so much expertise, um, and then adequate funding. And that's one of the things a lot of people don't take into consideration. Now, Jennifer's team here, they offer a lot of financing for mortgages, but there's a couple of qualifications. There are a number of mortgage companies that will lend on houses that they know they can foreclose on and resell quickly and easily. What they're not gonna do is lend on a property that is in a really bad condition. And so we're gonna talk a little bit later about how there are about three or four different types of investing in real estate that I'm really familiar with. Which ones require the most work? What type of work? What type of investment? And then um, also your potential returns that kind of come from that. So, um, and then there, our last group. They've got the money. They know real estate's where they want to be. Now they're looking for someone to kind of guide them or they're looking to assemble a team. And I can't tell you how often I talk to folks like that. Um, they are just ready to do something. And in my interactions with a number of my clients, a lot of them will tell me that, um, Terrell, I've got $20,000. Can't I put... 20% down on a $100,000 house, come in, put in some sweat equity on a credit card, um, put in a little bit of materials, and then potentially resell this thing, or um, turn it into a rental. And we're gonna talk about a couple of different types, a couple of different approaches. And so, let's jump straight to that. Um, uh, investment options. I wanna tell you guys a couple of stories about a few clients I've had. One, um, when I was in college years ago, I had one of my instructors, <coughs> professors who, uh, her parents owned and managed a number of rental properties. And so I'm going to ask for you guys to help me out a little bit here. I want you guys to guess. Pick any number. What do you think? Two people, how many properties is the most two people can manage rentals? Throw some numbers at me. And I'm going to make... Effectively? Effectively manage a couple. It's not one person, but two. How many do you think you can manage effectively? Two hundred if they're experienced. Okay. So five, we can do that one pretty easy. Um, you don't have to be a real, real estate professional to do five. Um, is there any numbers, a realistic guess, between five and 200? I would say 100. Okay. So the answer is there's no way in the world 200 people should be able to effectively manage 200, but they did, and that was a good, good pick. You get the jelly bean perfect guest um, <laughs> award. Um, so when she told me that, and here I am, I'm 19, 20 years old, and I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I thought about it. What does it take to accumulate 200 homes? Um, I, I wish Jennifer or Tim was here in the room for us to be able to answer a question, but uh, Fannie Mae has certain guidelines. They won't let you have more than X number of mortgages at a time. When I did loans years ago, that number was about 10. You cannot have more than 10 mortgages. Even with a 20% down payment, they're not going to allow you to have too many um, because if one person goes under or if one market goes under, they've got too many eggs in one basket. So, um, so rentals. Uh, it is one way that you can make money. It's generally uh, a low return on investment, um, and it requires limited skills. It's not something you have to be super specialized in. Um, and I'm going to tell you about two friends of mine, two clients, both named Steve. Um, one Steve I met years ago when I was doing mortgages only. And... Um, this particular Steve had about $50,000 and he said, um, Tarl, I'm going to need your help. This is back when I was doing mortgages. And he said, I'm going into the Heights area in Houston. I have access to permits. When permits are being pulled, I know when someone's about to demolish a house. And so what he does is he scrambles to find the owner of the property as fast as he can before they have it demolished. And he goes and knocks on their door. He calls them, finds their contact information, and he says, hey, before you tear down this 80 or 100-year-old home, I know it's in really rough shape. I think you're probably going to spend five, ten thousand $10,000 potentially to have it demolished and have it removed. I'll take care of that for you for free. So then he goes on the east side of I-45 in an area that uh, I can't tell you the neighborhood name right now, but it's between 59 and 45 inside the 610 loop just north of downtown. 
And what he was doing is he was going to tax foreclosure sales, and instead of buying houses that needed all this work, he was going and buying maybe a lot that was worth maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Once you get about three to five years worth of back taxes, eventually uh, they start foreclosing. Um, they're just going to say, hey, you know what, if it's your primary residence, there are some rules and kind of regulations you cannot foreclose on someone's primary without jumping through hoops. On a secondary home or an investment property, it's a lot easier to foreclose even for taxes. But if there's no structure on it at all, it's super easy. And so what they do is they would take these properties, auction them off, and he could buy some of these $15,000, $20,000 properties for $1,500. So he now had a piece of land, $1,500. He had a house. All he had to do, it was free, all he had to do was move it. So he would spend about $30,000, $40,000. He would remodel this old 100-year-old house, new plumbing, electrical, new sheetrock, new appliances, cabinets, all sorts of stuff, put a little landscaping in. And before you know it, he comes to me and says, Tarl, I've got $40,000 in this house. I need to cash out some of the equity. So at the time, we could do loans at about 90%. There were some lenders that actually go up to 95% for a loan-to-value ratio. So let's say that house is now worth $100,000. He's got 40000 in it. Let's say I just make the math easy. We give him $80,000 loan. So we've now put his 40000 back in his pocket that he originally started with, but now he's got a house. He rents it out. Some tenant pays his rent for him or pays the mortgage for him, but now he's got his 40000 back in his pocket. He's got a tenant. He now has a $100,000 asset that's appreciating at whatever real estate's appreciating at, but he's got an extra 40000 now of, let's call it the house's money, kind of to use a poker pun our uh, casino pun here, um, but he took that 40000 and did it again. But now, he's got his original investment already back in his pocket, so he takes the 80000 from that next job, splits it, does it two times, four times, eight, and it just keeps expanding. And within about three years, he had $2 million real estate portfolio doing this exact same thing. Now, one of the challenges, this is a high skill, high knowledge, um, way to make money in real estate, but it also requires specific market timing. That is not always an option in very many markets. You can't just pick up a house and move it a mile down the road um, just any time. That happened to be a nice place where you get land cheap and where the Heights area was growing at a real quick rate. Um, now lots over there kind of start at about 250, 300 just for dirt. Um, but so with his $2 million portfolio, he had tenants paying all of his mortgages for him, and he had this big giant pile of cash because he'd cashed out all that equity all the way along the way. And so he's able to take that cash and he was able to use that, go to the bank and get financing to start another school. So he has a school, uh, it's a trade school, a vocational school, where he teaches uh, kids that are out of, out of high school but aren't maybe ready for a four-year school, they're looking for some sort of vocation. And uh, he was able to start a second campus because of this kind of little side business he had in real estate. So that's Steve number one. Steve number two, uh, he was purchasing lots at a very similar kind of situation where he was grabbing lots, maybe at a tax foreclosure sale. He'd spend $1,000, $1,500 for them. And then he marketed properties outside of a real estate agent. He just put signs, uh, I think they're called bandits, at every stoplight. And it had a phone number on it. It said, uh, owner financing available, own a piece of America. And what he was doing is when people call off of that, he was able to sell these lots that he would buy for $1,500. He was selling them for thirty dollars and $40,000 a piece. But how many of us would own a thirty dollars or $40,000 car if we had to come up with thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 cash all at once? It's not real likely. We'd all have real nice cars. But if you can put it into a $500 a month payment, we'll all drive them. And that's really what it comes down to is he was able to offer financing in a way that allowed people that had never been given the opportunity to have credit available. They could use owner financing now and they paid him $400 a month. Um, but he would require a $2,000 down payment. So he'd pay $1,500 for a piece of land, sell it for 40 grand, get 2,000 down. He's got none of his own cash in the deal. And now he's just financing the $38,000 remainder over 10, 15, 20 years. He said a lot of the times, uh, they would not make their payments, he'd foreclose on them, sell it again, $2,000 down payment, and just went through that cycle and over and over again. He bought these up quickly enough to where at some point he said, every couple of months or years I'll have someone that will finally pay one off. Uh, or they'll come into some money and just knock it out. But he said, for the most part, uh, these things just kind of keep building and building, so every month he'd grab a couple. But he now owns about 100. 100 lots, 
no maintenance, no repairs, no tenants. Um, he's now a bank, but he has none of his own capital in the thing. So um, we've talked about my college professor in rental properties, and we've talked about Steve number one. Now, Steve number one required, it, required market timing, um, separate from the high skill uh, and kind of a mid-level investment of about 40000 This last one is very low investment, requires a lot of skill and a little bit of time. But the reason I've gone through these three uh, different options is because I want you guys to understand that there's more than one way to make money in real estate. It's not just what you see on TV. It's sometimes just kind of thinking out of the box. And there's the fourth option, which is more like what's here, where you're actually buying properties, fixing them up, and then resell reselling them. One of the things that you get stuck with oftentimes is when you buy a property and you hold it, then you're subject to market conditions. So like on Thanksgiving Day, OPEC met and determined that they were going to uh, keep producing at the same rate while we kind of have an excess of uh, oil right now. And as you might imagine, within any company, if you just from one month to the next cut your revenue in half, things are going to change. And I think the Houston market from uh, some of the reading that I've done and just my experience, we normally are about two quarters behind between major price cuts in oil and job losses. Uh, you might have seen some stuff on uh, the internet about Schlumberger letting, laying off, I think, 9,000 people. Um, I've seen some other companies, 5,000. We're going to see something change here in the Houston market, and it's going to be about two quarters, or let's say six months, uh, after Thanksgiving, where we're going to start to see jobs really change. But studies have shown that it's about a two-year change in the real estate market. So jobs and enough time passes, and eventually, um, now people have been out of work for a while, they start to get foreclosed and they burn through their savings. And so I'm not a huge fan of buy and hold. And um, there's a couple of different ways you can invest. And we've talked about all these different options. And the question is, which one do you pick? And that's going to kind of depend on what you're looking to achieve. And so um, let's take a look at the hexagon. Um, we've got um, the way I like to draw this. And, at my office, we've got a big marker board. We didn't have that here, so we put it in a little digital format for you. I figured it'd be a little bit easier than this. Um, there are three stages in life, and this is one of the things that I used to work with on the financial planners that I talked to. Um, you've got, in your first few years of life, working life, I should say, between the ages of maybe 20 and 40, we're focused on accumulation. As we get older, we're not trying to grow so much what we have. We're trying to just preserve what we've worked so hard for. And then lastly, kind of between the ages of 60 and 80, we're looking to spin down what we've worked so hard for over all those years. The problem is, if you guys are like me, uh, Friday's my 38th birthday. I'm about right here, and I haven't accumulated what I need to to be prepared to move to the next stage. And so you're not just getting off of one bus and then stepping onto another bus. It's a little more of a smooth transition. So let's say this curve should look something a little more like this. You've got to figure out if you know where you want to be, you've got to also know where you are to be able to develop a path on how to reach that. Does that make sense? So um, this is just a real simple uh, illustration to kind of show um, as you're growing your money, at the same time, every year that passes, you need to be kind of shifting towards a little bit safer. But the problem is a lot of us we are paying off school loans. Uh, education is super expensive right now, and, and I, th I think that's our next big bubble. I've done some reading and certainly suggest that uh, our young graduates can't afford to pay off this mountain of debt. Our education has become so expensive, and so we're either paddling so fast trying to keep our heads above water to survive, or we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. It's one of the two. And so we end up having to play a lot of catch up. And so in this, you've got to figure out where am I and what do I need to achieve to be able to get where I want to go? And so that kind of brings us to our next point. Um, we help at, at my company, the uh, Tarl Anderson Properties, we help a lot of our clients who are looking to sell a home that they've maybe been in for a number of years. And they come and say, look, I need to maximize my return on this. Uh, I really need to sell this house and cash out enough so that I can take enough to be able to put 20% down on my next house or I've got to take the equity from this house, pay off some debt, so that I can at least get rid of all that non-tax deductible credit cards, car payments, school loans, whatever the case may be. And so um, I often have clients come to me, and I'll show you guys a couple of examples here. Let's go ahead and pull up, um, let's do Burnham Wood. 
And I'm going to show you guys a couple of before and after photos. Um, this is one of the houses, and, and you all have just sold postcards in front of you. Um, you all have two, but you don't all have the same two. So here are some of the houses that we've sold this year. And if you flip over to the back side, you'll notice that we've circled, generally there's a red oval there. And that red oval is to kind of bring attention to the results. And we kind of refer to that in our office kind of as your evidence of success. We've got to show people that not only uh, are we working really hard to help them get their homes sold, um, but we're trying to help you get absolute top dollar. And we want to do one of two things. We want to set a record in your neighborhood for the highest price per square foot, or we want to sell your house for more than anybody else, any of your other neighbors. And part of the way we're able to do that is through the Tarle Team Advantage. So um, I have a client. Um, this owner came to us and... You'll see as it cycles through some of the photos here, this is a beautiful home. It didn't look like this when they came to me. Um, they lived in this home. It was their home office. They've got two kids under the age of 10. Um, it was what we refer to in the real estate industry as lived in. Um, but in these pictures, you can see here, and you may not be able to tell from looking at this. Hit control plus for me once or twice. See if that makes that any bigger. I'm kind of curious. OK. So by looking at these pictures, does this house look like anyone really lives here, or does this look staged? So a lot of big open space. You don't see anything on the counters. This home is actually lived in. And, but what we do uh, at our office, we have a very specific way of staging properties. And I always tell all my clients, there's three things that sell a house. There's your staging, the marketing, and the price. If one of those three things is out of alignment, then it's going to sit on the market for an extended period of time. So staging is what? It is when we get someone to click on our web link, we want them to go to the second photo. Uh, if they never get to the second photo, they never get a chance to see how great the house is. If we get them to click through the photos and schedule an appointment, we want them actually stepping through the front door. And when they step through the front door, we want them to be a little excited. We want that little fun buzz running through them that says, this could be my house. And so we want to remove everything that says anything about your education, race, religion, anything. I don't want them to know who lives there when we put your house up for sale because we want them to envision the future buyer's life there, not yours. And so we do a really good job of kind of cleaning out houses. And so this is the staging portion. And that house that we were describing earlier on Burnham Wood, uh, they came to me and said, hey, I need you to sell this house. And I said, okay, um, what are you looking for on this? What kind of time frame do you need to sell it within? And what price are you looking at? And they said, well, you tell me. You're the professional. And I said, well, as is, we're looking at about 300000 If you'll invest $20,000 into this house, I think I can get you three fifty. dollars So that would net them an additional thirty grand. Does that make sense? So it turns out they went way the heck over budget, which that happens a lot. Um, ask any investor, anyone that's ever flipped any house, has done any work. You start peeling back some walls, doing some things. And inevitably, it's going to cost more than you anticipate. So I told them, you're going to need to spend at least twenty. They spent 30, we sold it for 367. So they actually ended up netting about 37.5, I think, more than if they had not put the money in in the first place. The problem is that so many clients don't have that original 30 to put in. They don't have the time, they don't have the funding, whatever the case may be. So there are opportunities where real estate agents put houses like this on the market now, just like it is, and then some lucky dog gets to come in here and buy it for 300, and then turn around and put a little money into it and fix it up and, and resell it. Now, um, that's not always the case, but um, we were able to do that. I want to say it took us about a week to get that house sold, and some of you guys have maybe that Burnham Wood postcard. It should say DOM or Days on Market. Um, Lucy, what does that say on there? Does it say Days on Market on that white side? Seven days. Okay, so that, mar that house, you can see that some of the other houses in the neighborhood sat on the market for a little bit longer, but we were able to get a contract on that within seven days. And part of the way we do that is, I'm a bit of a tech nerd. Uh, my education background is in accounting and finance. I'm a number nerd. I'm married a number nerd. Um, so um, we, our hot date night is over an Excel spreadsheet many times. Um, so I know that the highest traffic day for real estate websites is going to be on a Tuesday. So we usually post our listings at about 9 to 10 a.m. on Tuesday because you've worked a uh, I'm sorry, you had a long weekend off, you come back on Monday, you're putting out all the fires, and then you come in Tuesday and you've got four days ahead of you. Last thing you want to do is 
start working. So what do you do? You start clicking around the internet. It's a nice, fun little distraction. And so many people do it. And that happens to be the highest internet traffic day. So again, we post our house between 9 and 10 on Tuesdays. Um, then um, we look for all the agents who've represented a buyer in a particular neighborhood. And we call all of them and let them know that we've got a new listing coming up. We also tell them, hey, we're going to send you an email later today. And it's going to have a video of this property along with 32 high quality professional photos. If you have any clients that are interested, please forward this link to them. And we're having an open house on Saturday, but I want you to know that the seller will accept the highest and best offer by 5 p.m. on Monday. So the whole process is six days. And we've had great success with this method. And we kind of refer to that as the Tarle Team Advantage in our office. You'll see that on all of our marketing stuff. And as you're flipping through that clear uh, report cover, one of those um, pages is called the Tarle Team Advantage. It kind of walks you through the different stages. So we've got photography. Uh, and Andrew's going to show you some examples of where you can find that on our website. So if you go to the home page, then you go to the very bottom. We've got the Tarle Team Advantage kind of floats around down here somewhere on a blue button. And then she's jumped ahead so that you can see um, staging. And it kind of talks about here, when you click on staging, it'll take you to another page where you can see some of the befores and afters of some painting, some renovation, some staging. It's all kind of in there. But it's not just photography. Um, it's video. And we're going to show you. Uh, one of our active listings right now, it's at the Mosaic. It's a high-rise condominium uh, not too far from here. It's over uh, near the Med Center. And uh, we have a superstar team, uh, which includes uh, Luke McKibben of Lucrative Visual Products. Uh, he does all of our photography, video, social media, and web design. He's done all of this stuff. But I want you guys to see, we have a really nice, really expensive drone helicopter uh, with a camera on it. And we're able to shoot all of these really nice properties and be able to help a potential buyer that's from another country potentially see what we have to offer on for our sellers. Um, the last three houses that we've sold, we've sold for cash. Um, we had a young man who's 18 years old who bought a house cash um, last month. And uh, Debbie, that was the one where we had our young uh, internet superstar, Taylor Caniff. Yes. he. Um, He's made a fortune somehow on the internet. I don't even understand it. Anyone over the age of about 30 has no clue. I'm one of them. But the guy made a fortune. And he bought this house sight unseen because of the photography and the videos. Um, you wouldn't believe how often that happens. And um, so we've talked about photography, video, a web presence. You can see here that we've got a pretty cool website. Um, but one of the things that we do for our clients, and if you'll open up another tab, we're going to show you another one of our listings at 11933queensbury.com. It's one of our high-end listings that we sold this year. And we actually purchase a domain name for every single property we sell. We have 2404wentworth.com for you already on the uh, banner sitting in the office. Um, we do that because that's part of the message that we send out on that Tuesday when we call those 100 agents, approximately 100, that have represented a buyer in the last year in that price point in that neighborhood. We're trying to drive those agents who each potentially represent 10 buyers to our listings. Um, here's where we get kind of crazy and people think, this can't work, Tarl. What are you doing? We post on Tuesday. We call those 100 agents on Wednesday, and we don't let anybody in the house Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. We jam them all through the door on our open houses on Saturday. Usually we open our doors at 10 a.m., and we have a line of agents sitting outside, cars parked all in the driveway and all around, because we've told them, we've created a sense of urgency by saying the seller will accept the highest and best offer by 5 p.m. on Monday. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to push so many people into a small space that maybe there's 15 people there. And Andrew's going to pull up a time-lapse video here for you um, where we put a little GoPro camera off in the corner on all of our open houses. We take a photo every five seconds for three or four hours while we have our open house. And we take all those photos and we put those into a time-lapse video and we email that to our sellers on Monday around 4 o'clock. We also put together an Excel spreadsheet that shows all of the offers and all of the kind of net values that they're going to get. And we allow them to pick from all the offers that we present. But one of the houses we sold this year, uh, which one of these postcards is on Breton Bay, we received 13 offers in the first 48 hours after we let our first body through the door. Of those 13 offers, 11 were at or above list price the seller was able to accept one of them, which was $500 or less than the highest, but it was for cash. 
no appraisal requirement, and it was done fast and easy. But part of the way we're able to do this is just this method that we refer to as, again, the total team advantage. Um, but you can see these open houses. This particular one was a little condo over in the Heights area. Um, one of these just sold postcards has that in there as well. Um, it was over on White Oak. And this property, they had not had a sale above 155000 on a two-bedroom, two-bath at the time. Uh, the client came to me, and I'm going to ask Andrew to do something I hadn't prepared her for, so if you would, be patient with me. Mm -hmm. Go to the newsletter button at the very bottom. And we pump out for the last 12 to 18 months or so, we have um, done a monthly newsletter where we kind of talk to our client database and we show them some of the things that we've got going on. But one of those is, if you would click right here, this is our White Oak condo, condo. And one of our guests here in the audience tonight um, does some work for us. And he may be in this video. I'll see, let you guys see if you can find him. Um, but this condo was not spectacular when it came to us. We spent, I think, we had about we a four. We this going on the market sometime next week. And we have done a ton. Let's watch this for just a second. Go ahead and turn it up just a little bit. It was a deep, dark red. Now what we've decided to do is we put a fresh new coat of paint throughout the whole place. We've put primer here on the red so that we can put a good fresh coat of uh, kind of a sand color. Uh, we're also replacing all of the light fixtures throughout the house here. We had a really futuristic, a little more uh, European so we've got, looking. Um, this house, and she'll have this up here in just a second, but... Um, when he came to us, I said, look, I can probably get you about 140, maybe 145 as it is. If you'll give me about a three or $4,000 budget, I'll probably get you closer to 160. But I have to tell you, that's out of the range that anything's ever sold for here. So at some point, the banks aren't going to lend anything be above the highest sale. And at that point, you've got to find buyers who are willing to pay cash to make up the difference. And so we were able to present him with multiple offers in this case. And we set a record for the community. And I have to check for myself. I know it was above 158. 163. So um, we sold that unit for 163 and set a record in that community there. Um, but you've got to know what repairs to make, who to hire to do them. You've got to get them done quickly. And then you've got to, what we like to say is the absolute must is you've got to have the Tarle team advantage to be able to help get that top dollar. So um, we've kind of walked through the three things that help sell a home, staging, marketing, and price. If the staging and marketing are both taken care of, then the price is determined by the people that come through the door. That's why we put that time-lapse video and we send that to our uh, sellers because we want to show them that we had 30, 40 people that walked through the property. Go ahead and let it just play, but mute it. Um, but we had 30 or 40 people that walked through that property just during our three or four hours on the open house. There is a point where on our time-lapse video where if you freeze it, which you'll never be able to catch it if you tried it 10 times, but there were about 17 people in the frame at one time uh, in this tiny little two-bedroom, two-bath condo. And again, that kind of comes back to the marketing. And so we go through the Tarle Team Advantage because I want you guys to understand that partnering with the right company or the right real estate team can make all the difference in helping to kind of realize your goals if you are thinking about investing in real estate, whether it be for rental properties, flip, or one of the more creative ones that you heard about earlier. Um, the investor group, and that kind of brings us back to, um, for those who were curious, I wanted to be able to kind of explain a couple of different types and how you can make money. But for the interested, um, it's important that you know that there are options out there for you. So one of the challenges, I have a lot of clients come to me and they say, I've got $20,000, I've got $30,000. The challenge is, is that you can't buy any house you want for twenty dollars or $30,000. What you can do is you can put a little down payment, do a little bit of repairs, and then the mortgage company has to finance the rest, but if the mortgage company finances the rest, and, and I'm just making this number up, let's assume that 90, 95% of all houses are purchased with bank financing, then by buying homes that cannot be financed, you eliminate 90 to 95% of the competition. By reducing the demand for the property, theoretically the price is gonna come down and you'll be able to buy that home at a better price. And so for my investors that I work with, um, we actually are gonna go through another property here that uh, was probably our more is not our most expensive repair this year, um, but it was probably the most in-depth. So we're gonna go to, um, click on investors for me, and then we're gonna go to, um, so Burnham Wood here was the one that we talked about first. This next one is Fiji Court, so if you would click on that for me, and then um, see more of Fiji Court. Um, we took photos on about five different days during this construction process, and. 
Um, Andrea, if you would get all four photos, no video there, but as these kind of scroll through, take a look here, and so hit control minus for me so we can get all four dates and all four photos to show up on the screen here. Okay, perfect. So you can see that this is the house in its very first condition here, and Andrea, if you would click through those, and let's just kind of buzz through them. Um, this house was in really rough condition. If you would, take it, go back for me one. Um, you'll notice there's a big fracture right here where this nine ton chimney started to separate from the house. It was so heavy that the builder, who clearly hadn't built in the Gulf Coast before, did a really thin foundation, really heavy uh, chimney off on the outer edge of this uh, property. And so it started to push down so much that it cracked, bent and cracked the slab. And as soon as it cracked and that pressure was relieved, it started sinking quick and it started to lean. And so we took that thing down, did it with um, hardy siding, and we were able to get rid of a lot of the weight. We were able to fix the foundation and make a bunch of repairs in there. But this was day one, so keep cycling through these and you'll be able to see this house was in pretty rough condition. It was actually lived in it. The owner had a tenant in, in there for probably 10 or 12 years, not the same one, but it was well lived in. Um, this thing right here, I have no idea what this is. Let's call that a 1973 terrarium. I, I don't know what the builder was thinking, but it became a trash receptacle for the tenant that occupied the property. Um, we had popcorn ceilings. We had ugly raw wood kind of cabinetry. Um, the appliances were mismatched. We had literally had black, white, and stainless steel in there. Um, you can see there are more cracks, uh, and I don't know if you can see it here, but this crack right here. So the chimney was over here, but we got this big crack. The house literally was splitting in two. So we were able to grab this house at about $60,000. This is all from the Crosby area. Uh, I didn't oversee this construction. I would have probably had it done a little bit faster, but we did get it sold within a matter of about three or four months. Um, I would have liked to have had that project done in 60 days or less so we can put it on the market, have a contract, and close within an additional 30 for not more than 90. Um, but if you get a chance and you want to go to the website, um, that room smelled like death, by the way. I don't know if they trapped a 14-year-old boy in there um, who hadn't showered for a long time, but it was in pretty rough condition. Um, but you can see the progress, and so we move Almost a month later, we finally got our tenants out, and we start to go through here. You can see some of the foundation repair. Um, this place just needed a lot of work. We put about 25, eh, it was 22, dollars $23,000, I think, in it in repairs. Um, it was a pretty in-depth project. Um, let's say about, and I'm just making this number up, let's say it was 22,000 repairs, 3,000 in holding costs. So we purchased it for about 60. We had 25 in it, 85 total and then we sold it for 125. Do all that in 90 days, grab a calculator and you work out the math. If you only had $100,000 to invest in real estate and you can do that every 90 days, that return starts to look pretty nice. But you've gotta have somebody oversee that construction project. Someone's gotta be on that job site at least once a week, if not once a day. Um, if you don't stay on top of these things, they get out of control, things get moving along too far so that it's really expensive to back up. So um, one of the things that we provide for our, some of our clients, there are some that just need some guidance. They want to have our list of contractors. And so um, if you would open another tab and go to the resource page for me, keep this one open, but open another tab and let's look at uh, the resource. So we've got a couple of partners that we worked with over the years. We try to vet them and make sure that we only advertise those who uh, are doing a really top-notch job for us and that we know we're going to do a great job for our clients. And so if you go to the top of our website here, click on the resource tab, we've got foundation repair companies, we've got painters, we've got flooring guys, we've got plumbers, electricians, um, we've got cleaning services, lawn companies, everything on here. Um, and all you've got to do is click on one of these tabs here and pull up whatever it is that you need. Um, we have relationships with insurance agents. Uh, Kicker Ferris uh, with kickerinsuresme.com um, is our number one referral for real estate here in the Houston area. Um, it is important that you don't just have the cheapest policy. It is very, very important that you make sure you have the right policy in place. I had a client uh, years ago, actually, I'm sorry, it was not a client, it's a friend of mine. Um, his mother's house, where we grew up, was really close to the water, and when Hurricane Ike came through, they had a couple of feet of water in the house. But, a tree had fallen on the house first. 
water started to come in through the ceiling. And so the insurance company took the time to come in and determine what damage could have only been caused by falling water and what damage was caused by rising water. They did not have a flood policy. They did not cover any rising water damage. Even if it would have been damaged by the falling water, also, if it then was damaged by rising water, it was not covered. So they needed about $80,000 worth of repairs to get this house back into shape. The insurance company cut them a check for 30 grand. My buddy, uh, who's about my age, had to quit his job for nine months. Luckily, he was in the position to do that, and he worked on his mom's house. Uh, they didn't have the resources to be able to um, designate that much time, uh, or I'm sorry, that much money into that repair. So they have a lot of sweat equity in that repair, but the right insurance agent and the right insurance policy would have saved them uh, a lot of time and trouble. So please make sure that you've got the right coverage. Um, that's super, super important, and it's important that you have the right team in place. And so we've talked about the Tarl Team Advantage. Uh, with regard to the investor group, how it works, um, people say, well, you know what, if I want to get involved, how do I get started? And you know what, I don't really want to be part of an investment group, but what if I've got my own chunk of money? I've got 200,000 cash. I want to start investing on my own. Can I just do it on my own? Absolutely, and we'd love to help you. Um, the challenge is, is that you buy a house one time, your money's all tied in that one project. I know that statistically you're looking at Nine out of 10 jobs you make money on, maybe four out of five uh, if things are tough. You will lose money on a project here and there. If you're in five, 10 deals a year, it all washes out. If you're doing two a year, you might hit one, bust on the other. So there is some advantage in pooling your money and kind of diversifying your risk a bit and having some partners who kind of share in that with you. So um, one of the things that we've kind of talked about is how do you go about buying these properties? How do you find them? And everyone says tax foreclosures. That sounds great. Call mortgage companies and ask them if they've got a foreclosure department. See if you can get on their list. But if you're not buying in a big enough quantity, they don't want to deal with one Joe Blow who buys a house every year. They want to deal with an investment group that's buying five a month um, because they know they can call them. They've got cash. They're ready to go. They don't have to interview them, vet them. They don't have to wonder whether or not the cash is going to be there when it's time to close. So um, there are advantages to being part of a group and pooling your money. Um, the repair part. Um, some people say, okay, great. I know how to find my own houses. I don't need your help. That's fine too. Um, but how do I go about repairing these? I work a full-time job. I don't have time to be on the construction site once or twice a week. Certainly not every day. Um, I don't have the contacts. So one of the things that my team does is we will recommend our contractors, if you'd like, and let you handle all of that. But we actually will uh, oversee the construction process for a fee if need be. Um, very often times that fee uh, is cheaper than what you make at your day job and so you need to just refer that business out. Um, if you need that help, let me know. Um, and then the last part of that equation is the selling. And that kind of comes back to the Tarl Team Advantage. We've, we know how to sell properties better than anybody in Houston if you ask me. Um, I challenge and actually invite you all, try to find someone that's doing something like this because I'd love to get some new ideas. Um, I feel like we're kind of on the cutting edge, um, but I feel like um, this industry, and I'm, by the way, I'm not quite, I used to be able to a couple years ago say I was 20 years younger than the average agent in this industry. Um, I'm creeping up on the average quickly, but there are a lot of uh, older agents who are just not willing to adopt some of the uh, new technology. They're not willing to learn any new tricks. And then there are a lot of agents that regardless of their age are just too new to the business to be able to be experienced enough to be able to offer you the experience uh, specifically that only comes from failure. <laughs> um, I've tried every way. I've failed a, a bunch of those ways. And we've figured out through trial and error how to make this work. So um, if you have any questions, any help that you need, we can help you as much as you want to be involved. If you want to be swinging hammers and rolling on paint, go for it. Um, we will be glad to help you identify those properties and then sell them when you're done. Um, and that kind of brings us to the last part of our presentation here, um, the funding portion. Um, we have been doing this and helping investors. Uh, we've had great success with it. I'd like to do more of it, and I'd like to help a number of my investor clients who say, I'd like to get involved, I just don't know where to get going. And hey, come on in. Um, I don't know how to get started. And um, too oftentimes, it requires too big of a chunk of money, too much expertise, too much time, 
And what we've done is we've assembled everything you need. So uh, we just had one of our uh, guests show up. Juan uh, does a lot of our contract work for us on a lot of our construction projects. Um, he has a great team of folks that he works with that he's able to maintain uh, multiple job sites at a time for us. And he's one of the first per people that we refer everyone to. Um, if he takes care of it, I don't have to do anything, and it really helps me out. So um, we love it when he takes care of our clients. But um, the benefit of kind of pooling all your money is that um, you're able to now, let, and I'm just making up these numbers. This is kind of a what-if scenario. But if we had a million dollars of cash, we can get 10 folks with $100,000, or we can get 100 with 10,000 apiece. Let's say each percentage of that million dollars of 100% each percentage is represented by $10,000. If you only had $10,000, you were 1% owner in the company. I don't own the company. It is not mine. Um, we have Nick Dupree here. Uh, he's an attorney. He does estate planning. And um, Nick, do you have a card? Oh, here it is right here. So um, he's a board certified in estate planning and probate. Um, I had a chance to sit through one of his presentations not too long ago. And Nick talked about... Um, how you can kind of plan for retirement. Um, you can plan for your family when you're not here anymore. Uh, there's a number of things that they do to help protect clients um, and their money. Um, I'm going to have him step up and speak here in just a little bit, but I want you guys to ask questions specifically about um, how would this work? What would this look like for this investment group? If, again, I'm not the owner, I'm not a manager, you guys just employ me to help identify the properties, potentially repair, oversee the construction repair, and then help sell them. But I'm trying to put together a group of like-minded people who have similar goals, who want to start to make some advancements um, to help you get kind of as we discussed earlier, our little curve and our uh, half hexagon there. Um, figure out where you are, figure out where you want to be, and then if you'll give us a call, we'll help you develop a path on how to get there. If you want to buy and hold these properties and be a landlord, we can certainly do that and manage those properties for you or help you just identify some good ones. I've envisioned it this way. If we had a million dollars, we've got each $10,000 represents 1% ownership, and we're able to fund that fully, um, that would allow us to be able to uh, then purchase, and I'm just making up these numbers again, purchase $200,000 worth of homes a month. If we purchase $200,000, and there's a real simple formula, and I won't pen it all down for you, but um, if I were to purchase $200,000 in January 1st, and just make the math easy, I purchased $200,000 on January 1st, I'm going to put about 50% of the original purchase price in in repairs. So $200,000 in purchases on January 1st, over the next 60 days, we're going to put $100,000 in in repairs. Now, that could be one property for $200,000, or it could be two properties for $100,000 apiece. Again, just making the math easy. Um, but that's $100,000 worth of repairs over the next 60 days. Right about the time we get that house finished, we put it on the market, we get a contract in six days because of the Tarleton Advantage. Um, we then have it sold and closed in about 30 days after that. That's about the average length of time that a mortgage company needs to be able to get a deal done. So that whole life cycle for that, that one house purchased on January 1st, in 90 days it's gone, and you've got that cash back. But now instead of the $200,000 in purchase price, $100,000 in repairs, we've got $300,000 invested in that one property. But on February 1st, we bought another $200,000 worth of houses. And we just, it's, it's a laddering effect. So the houses that you purchase on January, I'm sorry, on February 1st, we've got $100,000 in repairs going in over the next 60 days there. And then we get that contract, get it sold in 30, and then so you get all your money back 90 days after you purchase it. So let's assume we've got that kind of steady flow. Well, if we purchase a house on January 1st, February 1st, and March 1st, by the end of March, we're selling that first one. Now we've got funding for our April 1st house. But three projects with 300000 in them each, that's $900,000 tied up. But if we've got a million dollars, that gives us a cushion in case we go over budget or until that takes a little bit longer to to be able to sell. But again, it's not going to necessarily be one house at 200000 It might be three at 65000 70000 for the original purchase price. It just kind of depends on what's out there. One of the things that I've told a lot of my clients, specifically investors who come to me and want to do this, 
is there's a real simple formula. Your purchase price needs to be half of your final sales price. And you need to spend half of that potential profit needs to go in in repairs. If you stick with that formula, you can make money in this business. Where so many people screw up is they buy a house for 80000 they think they can sell it for a hundred. There's only $20,000 there and you're going to end up losing six, eight, ten percent of the gross sales price, the final sales price. We refer to that as the ARV or after repair value in our office. That six percent of that ARV goes to your real estate agent. Two percent goes to title companies and third-party fees, attorneys, things like that. And then you might have to pay for one or two percent in repairs, buyer's closing costs. So you're going to oftentimes lose ten percent of the value of the home when you sell it. That liquidation cost counted in on every house you buy. So if you bought it for eighty, you're losing ten thousand. Then, if you can get it worth a hundred and with your repairs, then your maximum profit is ten grand, and you've got to do some repairs out of that. There's just not enough margin there. But if you bought that same house you expect to sell for hundred, if you can buy it for fifty, you can put twenty-five thousand in in repairs. Now you've got seventy-five invested. You sold it for hundred, you're going to net ninety, so you got a fifteen thousand dollar margin there. And that margin is not money you put in your pocket. That's your cushion for this your learning curve. <laughs> um, when you're brand new to investing, you really need to make sure that you're really, really conservative on your first couple of purchases. If you don't have huge potential margins, um, you get too close to the edge, you end up upside down on your first two, one, two, three properties. And I don't mean all of those cumulatively, but if you're losing money on your first, second, or third property, it can wipe out the gains, it can wipe out your original investment nest egg, and you just quit. And so many investors do that. I have a number of clients over the years. I had one guy came to me. He said, Tarl, I just bought this house. It's a VA foreclosure. Now, this was years ago. I bought it for $65,000. I said, well, great. It sounds like it's pretty hard to lose. Well, he was a real handy guy, and he spent nine months repairing this on his own. He didn't pay contractors to do it. He literally did every single thing himself. He spent nine months worth of taxes, insurance, and interest. Those are holding costs that you now can't put in your pocket. And if you would have transferred ownership sooner, you could have let the new buyer pay for those nine months, and you could have taken that money and let them get the house for a cheaper price. Or what I encourage him to do, instead of taking nine months, and I'm just making up this number, let's say his holding costs over that nine month period were about 10 grand. He could have spent $10,000 on labor and had all that work done faster and had that property sold in 60 to 90 days he would have made the exact same amount of money, but he would have freed up his investment capital faster for the next project. The challenge a lot of investors come across is they're really handy, they've got great vision, they've got the money, but they don't understand the value of speed. So ask any of, do me a favor, go to tarlismyagent.com. Um, any of you who know me or know me well um, know that I may not be the easiest person in the world to work with. Um, I'm really particular, I like things done my way. Um, go to tarlismyagent.com. Um, in the uh, top of our HAR pages that they provide for us, they have an opportunity to rate all of your agents. <clears throat> and one of the things that um, people don't realize here in Houston is it's an all-in or all-out proposition. You either give every single client the opportunity to rate you, um, or if you don't, they take all your views down. So, if you'll notice here, we've got a, currently about 139 reviews. We've got a 4.93 out of 5. Who cares about that? Let's click here on the view of the rating detail, and I want to show you guys something. I ask all my clients, I, I tell them, I want you to tell me what you like and dislike about the process. If you say something negative and you don't give me a 5 out of 5, I expect some constructive criticism. And we do really well with our scores, but I want to scroll down just a little bit till we get to Burnham Wood. And I want to read something to you. It's kind of funny. Um, this owner, um, which is one of the houses that we featured here earlier, um, let me read this to you. It says, the photos and videos of our house were absolutely amazing, and his methods to selling a house, while can be a bit stricter than other realtors, proved to get us top dollar for the house, and only six days after listing. Um, I am a bear to work with. Uh, Juan can attest to that. I am up his backside all the time. I need this done yesterday, and I need it done cheaper, and I need it done better. And having someone who has the ability to be able to stay on top of these guys and make sure that the work's being done quickly and it's being done uh, with high quality and at an affordable price 
allows me to get out of one project, get onto the next. So to go back to our Fiji Court example, that was the house that we showed the pictures of, kind of the different dates and all the different stages. If you get a chance, you get home, look through that. Some of those pictures are amazing. We did some incredible work. Um, we tore walls down. We pulled ceilings down that were once vaulted. We brought them down. Um, we ripped out pretty much everything down to the sheetrock in that place. Um, but you can't do that if you don't have a good crew in place and you don't have someone overseeing them that has uh, a vested interest in your success. And one of the things that's true of everybody in this room is I know you all personally. I invited you all to come here um, and so that I could answer your questions. We've had a proven track record of success. We sold just shy of $11 million of real estate this year. Um, my hope is that um, we continue the growth rate that we have. We've had 50% grow, uh, growth uh, year over year in revenue for the last four business cycles. Um, I'd like to continue to do that, but it is exhausting driving folks around nights and weekends and showing houses. One of the great things about this investment group is I can get up and I know the numbers. I've got to be touring 50 homes a week on behalf of this investment group to be able to find 10 that I think are worth submitting an offer on. If we submit 10 offers a week, we might get two houses a month. But for that amount of time to be able to identify the really sweet deals, um, that allows me to have a nine to five and I can be home for dinner every night. Um, but that means I'm gonna have to set aside some of my buyer clients who refer those to some of the superstars that are on my team. So Misty Bacon uh, in the back of the room here. Um, she has done a ton of great work for my agents. Uh, 2014 was the first year where I actually felt comfortable handing off a lot of my buyers and she's a lot better looking and she's a whole lot more fun to be around. Um, so my buyer clients I think appreciate that. Um, but it allows me to be able to focus on my sellers and I'm really good at that part. Um, but if I'm able to hand off my buyers and sellers don't require a lot of my time specifically, I've got a great team supporting me, then that means it frees up my time for buyers. And one of the things that I looked at this year, we've got two pie charts on our little sales graph and they're broken down into four different pie pieces, buyer, seller, landlord, and tenant. We've got one pie chart that's based on units, one that's based on revenue. And I realized that in 2014, more than 50% of our clients were tenants. And yet they represented less than 10% of our revenue. And I realized that we need to make a change. We've got to shift more towards buyers and sellers. And the idea of nights and weekends, for me, uh, after so many years, I, I've averaged five and 600 property tours a year for a couple of years now. And it's just exhausting. But if I can get in and out of a house and I can look at 50 a week, I can literally be in and out in 10 minutes. Um, so it's easy for me. I know what buyers want because I've shown so many and I get to hear all their feedback. But for me to be able to represent a group of investors and be able to help you guys identify the good deals, know what it's supposed to look like in the finished product and be able to advise with our construction partners what these things need to look like when they're done. One of the things that you'll notice, if you would go back to Tarl.com, go to the Homes tab and then click on the Sold tab. Um, if you start cycling through some of these photos of all the homes that we've sold, in 2014, you'll notice the interiors are all very similar. We have the same paint color, a lot of the same finishes. It's plain vanilla. It's just we want to appeal to the largest group of people we possibly can. Um, we have some construction partners who've got some great vision, some wonderful ideas on how they can make this unique, super cool property. But the fact is, is those are expensive and there's a small number of people that like those. And so we want to appeal and we want to be super vanilla. Look how vanilla these houses are. They're, it's the same kind of apartment uh, complex, kind of uh, soft browns. Um, you've got, what's that? Kill beige. Yeah, we're, we'll kill you with beige, yeah. Um, we'd, we've got a landscape partner that comes in and he'll jazz things up, make it look a little nice. We've got some nice curb appeal. But it's not rocket science. The problem is, is that my investor that bought that VA home um, spent nine months on the project. He built it to his taste, not your average buyer. And so many investors, they've got great skills, but if you don't know what the buyers are looking for, you might lose $10,000 on the final sales price because you picked the wrong tile. Now that tile only costs two grand, but the wrong color selection, we refer to it in my office as removing the nose. Now this is not what you do with your grandkids uh, or your toddlers running through the house. Removing the nose we refer to as when you take away a buyer's reason why they might say no to buying this house. So every buyer is going to have a certain number. It might be, I've got seven reasons why this house isn't perfect. 
Another buyer might have 12 reasons, but we want to remove as many of those no's as we possibly can. And that generally means super vanilla. Um, but in doing that, we're able to appeal to a large group and really do well in helping our sellers get top dollar. And that, that, that client who purchased that VA home, I think he got lucky. He sold it for 130000 and that sounds like he made a killing, but when you subtract all of his time, time he wasted in that house nights and weekends that he could have been spending on the golf course or with his family, what's your time worth? And we want to provide an option where investors can simply pen a check and sit back and watch their money grow. And then if you want to step in and watch what's going on so that there is that level of transparency that makes people feel more comfortable, that transparency that you don't have when you send your money off and your paycheck off to your employer for your 401k. If any of you had too much of your money in uh, uh, oil companies in the last 90 days, you've seen that take a beating. If you look at the stock market, it certainly struggled. And one of the things about real estate is there's always money to be made. Um, sometimes you'll make 20, 30% on a property. Sometimes you make 10. Um, sometimes you lose. But if you build the right team and you have enough of the right guidance, it can really help that process. And so we're here to offer that process uh, and that help as you need it in whatever capacity you guys are interested. Again, we've been doing this for a while. We've had great success. We simply are inviting you guys. If you'd like to get on board this train, you're welcome. So that's really all I have for you guys this evening. If, if you guys have any questions, please ask away. But I want to, we're creeping up on 730. I told you guys you'd be out of here by then. Yes, ma'am. I won't yeah. be a part of that. <laughs> so, well, and it's like, well, I did the painting, I did the artwork, I spent 12 hours, I spent 20, I don't want to deal with that. So the way I've envisioned this is if, let's say you personally have 200000 you want to invest, and you want to buy a $100,000 property, put 50000 in, and then you want a $50,000 cushion in case things don't go the way you want, then I'll help you identify that property. We'll get you all the way to the finish line. You can sell it on your own. That individual investor with that property. Correct. Yeah. If you want to do the repairs, then yes. Yeah. Most of my clients work a day job. They've got a certain amount of money. They may not have 200000 And I generally recommend, and again, this is coming from, uh, I coach financial planners for a number of years on how to advise their clients properly. Don't ever put more than 20% of your investable portfolio in one basket. You need to have it spread around a little bit. And if someone told me they had $100,000 total, I'd say you don't need more than $20,000 in here. Um, I, if you're not putting in more than 20%, then if things don't go the way you want, then it's not going to kill you. Um, too many people, uh, little old ladies who haven't saved, who come to me and say, I've got $30,000, that's my whole retirement. Can you invest this? And I'd love to see you double it in three or four years. We could probably do that. I won't. I just... And if someone's got three or $4,000, I say, wait till you've got 10. Buy one percentage point. Let's keep the math easy. Let's not make this an accounting nightmare. We've got a bookkeeper uh, already in place. We've got Nick handling the legal stuff. We've got the construction crews. We've got title companies. We've got insurance agents. We've got it all here. We just need the funding. And um, again, it's not, I'm, ask, I'm not asking you guys to write me a check. I'm saying, if you come together in this group and you ask for my advice, I'll say, this is the property you ought to purchase. Now, let me just tell you how this might look. Um, as a buyer, you'd have the ability to give the authority to your agent to write contracts on your behalf. So let's say we have 100 members, all with $10,000. Make it super simple. They're all equal partners. Um, but you elect seven board members. Those seven are responsible for certain duties that nobody else will have to deal with. But I submit 10 contracts a week and I do a 10-day option period on each. Um, usually the first or second day after we have an offer accepted, I'm gonna have my construction partner out to the property. He's gonna write up a bid. I'm gonna be with him before the, construction, the investor group owns it. The construction guy and I are gonna go through the whole house. The offer's been accepted, but we've got an option for you. It costs you maybe 200 bucks. The investment club, 200 bucks. But um, that gives us a 10-day unrestricted right to back out. 
we can put together a whole summary of what the costs are going to be to repair this home, present it to the board. We've got an odd number. Let them vote. Do you want to move forward with this one? We had three offers accepted this week. Do you want to move forward with this one, this one, or this one, or this one, this one, and this one? Your, your call. Again, I'm not an owner. I'm simply advising. Um, but if we know that our numbers make sense and we have the option to buy three different homes, if you have the funding, buy all three. If they're all really sweet deals, jump in, do it. But you've got to have the capital there to be able to pull the trigger. And too many people don't have adequate funding to be able to do it in a way that is going to help them get the returns that most people are looking for. And again, if the mortgage company will lend, you probably don't want to be buying that house. That's a simple, uh, if you'll use that purchase price plus 50% for repairs and then double your original purchase price as your projected sales price. And then if a mortgage company will lend, you shouldn't buy it. Those are some real simple numbers. If you'll just follow those, it makes it super easy. Um, an exception would be that house on Burnham Wood where they came to me and said, my house is worth or we'd like to sell it as is, and I said, well, I can probably get you 300. That means, as an investment group, we could have gone in and purchased it for 300, invested 30,000 in it, sold it for 367, and we'd have had that margin. Now, we could have used a mortgage company, so instead of $330,000 investment, we have a 20% down payment, 30,000 in repairs, and we've limited our cash outlay, which frees up a bunch of our other capital to be in other projects. So, I hope that answers your question. As an individual, yeah. And I have, have some clients come to me and say, hey, I've been part of partnerships before. I've been burned by it. I don't want any part of it. I've got my one friend who I trust or my one family member that I trust or I want to be myself. That's fine. It's just if I'm given the choice to help 10 different investors who all have not heard $1,000 a piece, how am I going to present one house to 10 people? Now they're all bidding against each other. Yeah. I'd rather everybody pool their money and everybody gets to make the big return rather than having them bid the price up and squeeze the return. That just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So um, when outlining this presentation, um, that was kind of what I was trying to determine. Is this something where I, I don't expect people to start uh, <laughs> passing the plate around um, and throwing in your checks. My hope is that we can if you simply, and you don't have to do it here and you don't have to do it tonight, but simply raise your hand and say, I'd like to be interested, or I am interested, I'd like to be involved, I'd like to learn more, then we can set up another meeting. Um, with another meeting, with this much basic information, at that point, then we can start to have you guys talking to each other and discussing how you'd like it set up. But it's not really for me to decide. I can advise you, but that's for the investors to determine um, and certainly with me and Nick kind of advising you on that, I think we could do that pretty quickly and easily. It's simply a matter of, for example, let's say we could only put together two or $300,000 right now. We can go get our first house, maybe two houses. But if we don't get deep enough into it and have a, a reach that critical mass, then um, you might find yourselves buying one house every three months. And then as it grows and you pull new people in, one of the things that Nick and I talked about this morning was, you allow people to step in once per quarter. You can reevaluate the company at that point, but that might create an accounting nightmare. Um, not just to try to evaluate all the properties that you, your investment group owns. So do you do it quarterly? Do you do it every six months? How do you handle that? Maybe for the first year, you let people in every quarter. After the first year, it's every six months, and then it's once a year. And if you want to get in, you've got to do it quickly um, because every day that you're not in it, or you jump in whenever you want, but you don't start to benefit from those proceeds that you've invested until the next cycle. It's really up to you guys however you want to set it up. Any other questions? So I got a lot of my retirement in oil mm -hmm. businesses, so I'm always looking at the forecast. What is the forecast for the housing market in this scenario? So as I briefly touched on earlier, there are statistics that support basically a two-quarter delay between when oil drops by more than 30 percent, you see a significant drop in employment uh, or a rise in unemployment about two quarters later. About two years after that 30 percent drop in oil, you start to see housing prices change. So let me explain something. And, and again, by the way, it is past 730. Any of you that need to leave, please feel free to do so. Um, but um, 
one of the things that we track in the real estate market is the total number of homes that were sold last month. And we divide that number into the total number that are available now. So let's say there's, in Houston, 30,000 homes available for sale today. But 10,000 were purchased last month. That means if no new homes are put on the market, the 30,000 that we have will be absorbed in three months. So we've got a three-month inventory. That number has been hovering between two and a half and three and a half for most of the last year or two. That number is supposed to be about six months. We have way too many buyers and not enough sellers. And when you have that increased demand and a limited supply, prices go up. As the demand falls, and if the supply were to stay the same, prices will drop. Does that make sense? And so we're not looking to see price drop in real estate. We're looking to get to a certain level of normalcy where it's not, its trajectory is not like a rocket ship. I tell my buyer clients right now, if you're looking to buy a house, be ready to overpay. If you're not ready to overpay, now is not the time. I told you about that house we put on the market a couple of months ago and we got 13 offers. 11 were at or above list price. And that was within the first 48 hours. Imagine being the second buyer in that line. You've reached for the stars and you still came up short. Um, statistically, I know that my clients have to look at about four or five homes before they find one that they're willing to make an offer on. Years ago, you looked at five houses, made an offer, probably had it accepted. Maybe you don't like the seller's terms or the inspection doesn't come back well and you change your mind. But now my buyers are looking at four or five homes, making an offer, they don't get it accepted. Second group of five, they make an offer and they don't get accepted. Third group, most of my clients are submitting four or five offers before they get aggressive enough with their offers to have one accepted. So now I'm showing 25 houses when I used to show five. Um, my picky buyers maybe 10 or 15. Um, now it's 25 to 50. Um, so as the market cools off, we're just going to get back to a, a level of normalcy that we should be in. So it will make purchasing homes a lot easier. Does that make sense? But you'll be involved in that with the group. Absolutely. And, and by the way, again, because I'm not an owner, um, I'm not a shareholder in any way, I can be hired or fired at any time. Um, there are 25,000 real estate agents here in Houston that are a member of HAR. Um, I'm not the most experienced, um, certainly not the best looking, um, but I know my niche pretty darn well, and I have a business background that a lot of other real estate agents just may not have uh, had a chance to experience. Um, they know houses well, they know buyers, and they know sellers, but without that business background and kind of understanding the value of speed, um, you just, it's a different experience. And as I told you guys earlier, I'm an 80-hour-a-week kind of guy. Uh, a lot of agents get into real estate because they like the idea of working 20 or 30-hour weeks. Um, it seems like an easy job, and so there isn't a ton of competition, in my view, uh, from other real estate agents who are willing to put in the work that would be required to assist this investor group. So um, I feel my position is pretty secure. It's simply a matter of putting the investor group together who are like-minded enough to start to move forward on the same direction. Any other questions? If there aren't any, then I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, I know it's, we've run over quite a bit. Um, I would encourage you guys, if you want to take those clear reports, uh, report covered, uh, there's some stuff in there about our team. If you have any questions, please feel free to call anytime. We're super easy to find, tarl.com. And uh, otherwise, feel free to grab some food, take it home to the family, and uh, I'll stick around for a couple minutes and answer questions if you're too shy to ask in front of everybody else. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming.